Sure. I think, you know, he doesn't really need an introduction. He knows, we, everybody knows him from our institution. You know, he came to visit us a, couple, a year ago or two and he's world famous microsurgeon. I think he's like the most famous microsurgeon every country in this. He has, he has also traveled to every country in the world, you know, sharing his knowledge and teaching everyone. Um, and he's going to talk about diabetic foot reconstruction today for us. Wow. You guys all stay engaged and ask him lots of interesting, tough, even simple questions. Yes, and everybody He's mute. for the residents. All right, so so thank yes. you for the great introduction. You know, when I ever engage with you guys, it feels like I'm home. I mean, I have brothers there, Charles and Scott, sister, Esther, and a lot of bunch of great friends. So guys, uh, let's uh, let's start a little bit different. I want everybody to close their eyes. Let's close their eyes. Bear with me for five minutes. All right. All right. Close your eyes and think of a foot, diabetic foot. That is rotten. That is rotten. That is half rotten, black, discharging pus. And think of it as you put your nose near that rotten foot. Do you smell that? Do you smell that? that that foul odor that's right and that's what diabetic foot is all about if we don't manage that foul odor pus discharging foot this patient is unfortunately going to have his leg amputated and that's what we want to talk about today so guys if you want to keep on closing and imagining that foot you know, I, I think it's a good way to have yourself a good, nice diet tonight, to so lose some weight. But otherwise, uh, we're going to start with the uh, talk. So, so the reason why I asked you to imagine this is, you know, when a diabetic foot patient walks into my clinic, and I sort of look at the foot, touch the foot, squeeze the foot, smell the foot, don't worry, I'm not licking the foot for sure. But, you know, the first reaction I get from the patient is they're in tears. Unfortunately, these patients are so neglected that a lot of specialists or doctors they go see, you know, just looks at it, gives them antibiotics, whip up a dressing on it, and that's it. So if you really plan to go into the service of providing care for diabetic foot patients, you need to let them know that you really care. And caring, remember, is holding the foot with both hands, taking it to your nose, and start smelling it. That's caring. And then they'll cry. They'll cry. All right, so that's my tip. Why I have so many I have so many diabetic foot patients? They say I'm the only su surgeon who smells their feet. You know, you get addicted to this too. It's pretty good smell after you smell like thousands of feet. But anyway, uh, we're going to be talking about diabetic foot today, well, this morning, and for you guys, uh, 5 p.m. So basically, when you think about diabetic foot, there are um, four components to this, and uh, there's a component of controlling the infection, as we just mentioned about the smelly diabetic foot. There's the component of uh, making sure that the foot has an adequate vascular supply. And of course, foot is a skeletal structure that bears all our weight. So you have to think about the function, the kinetics. And then if there is a, a piece of skin or tissue missing, then we have to, of course, reconstruct uh, to to recover the normality as much as possible. So the major key players when we think about foot reconstruction or the major key components are skeletal components, the vascular components, and the soft tissue components. So if you choose to do diabetic foot, you could either you could think you know have a good team, or you could do all three. Now. Uh, even if you have a good team, you need to understand what they're doing and in a way provide some simple service they're doing because they're very busy people 
and then you yourself does simple ortho or vascular work yourself. That's the three main components directly in relationship with the reconstruction. But there's a huge other component where the patient has to be well, uh, have a good nutrition prior to surgery, making sure that the blood sugar level is controlled, uh, making sure that the patient is getting the consultation at the right time. And then, of course, there are a bunch of people in supporting uh, this effort. Now, the reason why in the beginning that we didn't really have a good outcome, and we'll be talking about this later, is because everybody was trying to do diabetic foot on their own. The vascular guys were trying to do it. The ortho guys are trying to do it. I'm trying to do it. The endocrinologists are trying to do it. And we couldn't bring our, our, our special fields together to create a synergy. And by the time other specialties or myself realize that oh, something else is missing, unfortunately, it becomes too late for the patient and they end up in an amputation because there was no coordination. And the reason why there's no coordination is because there's lack of communication. We just hold on to the patient, you know, uh, and, and by the time that we realize, oh, this guy needs other help, you know, we, we've lost the golden time. So I think if you want to really build a good team, you know, you got to get together, not only have a good uh, chemistry of work, but also really build a good personal relationship. I think that's the way to have a good team. I mean, it's not my excuse to go get a drink every night, but that's the way a team works. And gradually you understand, hey, what is their role? What is their responsibility? What is my role? And then support each other despite the busy schedule and have respect for each other. And then ultimately, I'm happy about it because the patient benefits with the best result. And then I make a lot of new friends. Now, the vice versa also works. I mean, sometimes, you know, different departments take a look at it. Oh my God, this dirty stuff. I don't want to do it. And they just send it off to me or send it off to another department. And the patient bounces to multiple departments before the patient finds the right department. So there's a lack of coordination. So the first thing we did was actually hire a clinical nurse who would see all diabetic patients and who would screen all their diabetic foot. So we got a very good coordinator who understand what is the priority among the players regarding the diabetic foot. And also we came to an agreement that all diabetic foot patients goes through our diabetic center. So the diabetic foot patient doesn't walk straight to vascular, ortho, or plastic. They have to go to the diabetic center to see that clinical nurse. So she would be able to coordinate and educate and have an efficient pathway for the surgeons or the, the caregivers to come and give uh, a, a, a prioritize the, um, the, um, the care and also have a ideal way so there's no time lost. So we actually built this um, algorithm for our nurse. And basically, unless it's an emergency case, uh, if it's a bone deformity, vascular deformity, what is, the, what is the main priority? But if there is an emergency case, then it will straight, uh, the patient will straightly go to the ER and the plastics will be involved to do a emergent debridement. Also, the post-care will be seen by this nurse in high-risk patients every three to six months, in low-risk, six to 12 months. And we make sure that the patient follows up because when you do this, if you don't educate the patient or lack of education, or if you fail to motivate the patient, this patient will come up with a recurred ulcer. And then you'll start the whole process again. And what's the point of reconstructing if you're going to see this patient again three months later with a, a broken down flap, you know, broken down uh, infected skin? So there's no point. So unless you're able to educate them and motivate them and then really have this um, uh, fixed foot maintained well, it becomes a huge, huge problem resource wise. And, and, it, you know, and then you just get frustrated and just, you know, tell the patient to go home and get amputated. As a plastic surgeon, we play a main role in, in this diabetic foot care. We have the ability to know 
what soft tissue is dead or not. Uh, we also, because we have that ability, we know how to heal wounds. And we also know how to cover big wounds through grafts, local flaps, and microsurgery. And if your orthopedic or vascular colleagues are trying to do their on this do this on their own, they'll they'll have they'll do some grafts and local flaps, but you know it will be really really less optimal because sometimes you need good flaps, you need big flaps, and in the feet these flaps are very very limited. So we have that ability to have a a better resurfacing that leads to better function. So when we started a team together. We had to have a common goal. So everybody would, would, would sort of aim for that goal together. And that goal was basically salvaging their leg and giving them a second chance to walk on their own feet. And we try to change their lifestyle. After the operation, if they're gonna walk their dog instead of themselves on a treadmill or walk their dog from a car, I mean, that's just not the way this works. So it's a huge challenge to, to change their lifestyle and of course, in diabetic patients that does not have foot ulcers yet, increase their awareness that, you know, you should take care of your feet before you run into trouble. So these were the common goals among the team. Now, if you look at the ultimate prognosis of diabetic foot, especially after amputation, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's eye-opening. Now, if you tell someone, hey, look, I have colon cancer, then we say, oh my God, you have cancer. Oh my God, I feel so bad for you. I hope you enjoy the rest of your life. And you know, uh, there's, you know, tr people try to support you and engage with you because, you know, colon cancer, five year survival is 50%. One out of two will ultimately pass away after getting some treatment. Did you know it's the same for diabetic foot amputation? Once you have major amputation, one out of two will pass within five years. The five-year mortality rate for diabetic foot after major amputation roughly is the same as colon cancer, about 50%. But what is the social response when you say, oh, I have diabetic foot? Okay, so, and there's no, oh my God, you know, this is such a serious business. And you know, if you look at the numbers of people getting amputated from diabetic foot, it's staggering. One major amputation due to diabetes every 30 seconds around the world. Does one patient die every 30 seconds from cancer, colon cancer? I don't think so. So if you look at the numbers, it's staggering. And if you look at the ultimate outcome, it's staggering. So if we can, as plastic surgeons, make a difference in this, then this is something that we can be engaged in changing not only their quality of life, but also the quantity of life. So this is what we sort of thought. And when I joined, early in the service after I joined a uh, Asan Medical Center and started to get some interest in diabetic foot. These are some of the cases that came to me. And, uh, you know, the major amputation rate in the early uh, days of uh, Asan when I joined was 22%. So that means one out of five diabetic foot patients who walks in will ultimately get an amputation. So our goal was to put together a, a, a team and then immediate goal was to reduce the major amputation as much as possible. Then why, why is diabetic foot not an interest to a lot of plastic surgeons or in general to other ortho or vascular surgeons? Because it's a very, very difficult field. And as you can see, the spectrum of treatment is so wide from controlling diabetes to, to wound care, good standard of care. If that doesn't work, we have some tricks up our bags, uh, you know, gene therapy, cell therapy, stem cell, hyperbaric oxygen, growth factors, and negative pressure. And then ultimately, if that doesn't work, we have the surgical options. Now, it is, as you can see, 
the spectrum of treatment is so wide. And this is why a lot of the times, you know, we don't want to be bothered with, uh, you know, making difficult or decisions that we don't know. So this is why a lot of people just say, oh, my God, this doesn't work. You know, let's send this to somebody else. And the reality is this diabetic patient starts spinning around and around. They don't get the right care and unfortunately end up in amputation. So let's take a look at these spectrums and try to understand why understanding this whole spectrum of diabetic care is important. Now, when I see the patients, the first thing I make sure if they need some kind of um, care to heal their wounds or even undergo reconstructive surgery, nutrition is super important. I think a lot of times we miss looking at this. It's the same thing as pressure ulcer concept. The patient needs fuel to, you know, to overcome their or to provide uh, proteins to in during their uh, chronic illness or in the healing phase. When the car goes up the hill, you have to push the accelerator. The same thing with our body. When it's challenged with a big wound, you need a lot of protein. So we try to make sure we balance their nutrition. And we look at pre-albumin as one of the major uh, index and make sure that they are in good nutrition while they undergo therapy. Also very important is controlling blood sugar level. So we make sure that the patient prior and more especially after surgery, the patient has a good control of their blood sugar level. And this is where I think IT really makes a difference in, in making sure that the patient complies a little bit better. Because in the past, when they send them home, when we send them home, you know, the patient will come back with poor uh, sugar level control. But now with IT, we're able to measure their blood sugar level through the mobile application and store it in, a, in, our, in, our, um, in our data. And then when the patient goes out of the norm of that blood sugar level, the patient gets an automated text and sort of guides them to watch their weight, you know, watch their diet, control their blood sugar level, exercise more. So in a way, it's a nagging, it's a nagging app. If you don't have a wife who nags a lot and say, you got to stay healthy, you know, stop eating that chocolate, then this is the next best thing, the nagging application. So we've actually looked into this and this nagging application, we should name this app, the diabetic foot nagger. But anyway, uh, has actually shown statistically that it reduces and controls and prolongs the HbA1c level in these diabetic patients. So we know that this kind of IT, a simple application could help patients maintain good blood sugar level. And now we're coming up with a scale that also monitors temperature. When there is two degrees Celsius temperature between two feet, we know that one foot is becoming inflamed. And by having them go on this temperature sensitive scale, then they're able to detect early changes in their feet. We're also trying to come up with a device to detect their wounds, but I actually haven't got it gotten there yet. The protocol is if their temperature is off, then they get an automated appointment and then we gotta try to try to intervene as early as possible. So these kind of IT technology does help. What's also very important is educating the patient. Uh, this you could do on your own, or you could do with. 당뇨에 걸리면 피가 끈적거려 미세 혈관까지 잘 닿지 않습니다. Or you could do it with uh, the society, or you could do it with a network. Uh, we try to simple. We try to you know have simple video education for for the patients and make them understand what is the outcome, and to to motivate them to learn about their disease. Try to make it simple. Uh, we also have small booklets that, that patients and their family could read. And most of all, we have campaigns like cut your feet two seconds a day. So when they feel a rise in temperature and they know that they're in trouble and they visit as soon as possible. So it is, I think, in our, in our power to actually do this one-to-one -one with the patient through education by using nurses or have big campaigns and and, and, and make booklets to do your share in trying to increase the uh, education and, make, and help them understand and help them be aware of the situation. So this is basically the basic care that the patient needs to start with. And when they have a wound, it's also important that they manage their wound because a small wound ultimately leads to a larger wound. A uh, golden standard of care involves, of course, debriding, making sure that there's no dead tissue. 
and then using proper uh, dressings. And this is why understanding what dressing does what is important. Making sure uh, they have a good vascular supply, uh, offloading if they have problems in their plantar surface. And of course, if they have big edema, they're not going to heal well. So controlling the edema also is important. Now, most likely is that, you know, there's going to be multiple players when you do diabetic foot. And even though you have this great basic care, it's very important to communicate with other partners. And the first step in having a good communication is having a unified classification. Some people might use Wagner, some people might use different. So in our hospital, the first thing we did was, okay, let's everybody from now on, when we communicate, we're gonna use University of Texas San Antonio classification. I like this classification because it not only tells you about the depth, but it also tells you about the condition of the soft tissue. Does it have infection? Is it ischemic or is it both? So when you say 2C, it just tells you, okay, wow, this wound is penetrating to the tendon or the capsule and it's ischemic. Then we know vascular has to be involved, plastic has to be involved. So it's a great way to communicate each other. Hey, look, this patient start off with a, a 2C, now it's a, 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 you know, 1A. So we know the progress. So you have to have a common language. Somebody uses Wagner and you're using UT a classification, then you're gonna ha have a mix up. So this is the beginning, how to make a good communication between the multi-special fields. Also important is that we decided to have a unified way to, uh, to analyze bacterial culture. Now, swabbing is good, but the problem with swabbing is that the specificity is very low. So if it says it's negative, it's not truly negative. So among the old department, entire hospital, when we see a culture, now we know that all the cultures are biopsy. Um, um, they're taking cultures from biopsy, soft tissue cultures. So now we know that every department is taking biopsies and, 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 and making cultures from them. So we believe uh, whoever, whenever we see the result, we don't have to do another test. So this is another common understanding we made. And based on this, when we see use of antibiotics, sometimes the endocrinologist could use it first, sometimes the nurse could use it first, or sometimes the vascular could use it first, you have to have an agreement on which broad spectrum antibiotics to use because we don't want to build resistance. So we have a common understanding on what antibiotics to use prior to getting the culture sample, a culture um, a report. So this way uh, we could uh, prevent uh, the patient from having any possible chance of resistant. So the basic idea here is whoever sees the patient ends up doing this kind of common uh, steps and then we're able to know, ah, okay, we could pick it up from there and, and just leave all the past reports and then move on. So this is the good standard of care. And you could see that here in this slide, again, multiple departments could be involved. But a lot of times for minor wounds, it would be the plastics. Uh, I think in, in your case, it could be the podiatrist as well. Um, we don't have podiatrists in Korea, or the, but we do have uh, uh, clinical nurses who take care of small wounds. Uh, and then uh, it will also could in, uh, involve your interventionist when, the, when you suspect the vascularity is poor. Simple way to do it is just palpate the dorsalis pedis and the posterior tibial. If you feel that the palpation is weak or there's no palpation, or when you palpate, just not palpate it alone, but also move around your finger. And sometimes you'll actually feel like a hard core-like structure where the dorsalis pedis usually have to be. That means this vessel is so calcified that you, know, you don't feel the pulse. You could actually feel the calcification of the dorsalis pedis. In that case, of course, you have to send it to your interventionist to, to have better circulation. When you manage the wound, it's very important to motivate your patient because a lot of the times you will see these kind of wounds in our clinic and we'll tell the patient, go home, do your own dressing, come back after two weeks. And we will prescribe them, you know, which dressing to use, how to do it. And a lot of the times before when I was ignorant, you know, I would look at this wound and say, hmm, okay, good, it's getting better. 
And I'll just write, it is getting better on my chart. But we have to have an objective measure to actually see how much the wound is getting, getting better. And one of the ways is actually measuring the long axis and perpendicular to the long axis, you know, 90 degrees perpendicular, and then measuring the longest width. That way you have a rough size estimate and then you document it. And then you share with the patient when the patient comes back two weeks later. Ah, look, ah, this wound is redu you know, reduced 10%, 15%. I think we're on the right track. I think you're doing a great job, you know, doing your dressing at home. And the patient compliance goes up. And we also know what the, reg the regimen that we're doing now is working. However, if there's no wound uh, size change in four weeks, this is a very strong indication that your current regimen will not work. So in that case, you have to think about other measures. So nowadays, instead of doing that, uh, there's a multiple um, apparatus. I think there's even free apps on the phone that you could actually uh, take photos and measure uh, the, um, the, uh, the size. However, we like to use this map, uh, this app uh, based on the uh, uh, iPad. It measures a 3D volume. And then yeah. we're able to basically have a very simple and quick reading uh, just by, by, by using this um, um, uh, application. And then this application is automatically uploaded to our EMR. So it really makes it easy for us to look at the improvement of the wound. So this has been uh, documented and been shown to be very effective. And we've been using this uh, for a, the last uh, four years. So that's how good standard of care is actually made. Now, like I, get, like I said, if the wound gets aggravated in the initial care or if the wound is big, uh, and then you have, and we have many tricks up our bags. For example, we have MPWT, uh, growth factors, and all these multiple other uh, regimens. Now, I would quickly want to talk, about, talk to you about MPWT because I think this is a very important part of the, uh, the, the, the solution we have. And the way I like to use it is if the patient has a very poor systemic condition or the patient doesn't want general surgery, a flap coverage for this case would be indicated. If not, or for some reason, this patient cannot have a flap, maybe poor circulation or whatever, then we go ahead and try to use an MPWT to maximize the rate of granulation. At the same time, we start suturing uh, to try to uh, close the, um, the area of the skin. And then it basically, um, with the right approach, we, we are able to have this kind of good healing uh, within a month or so using MPWT. It's fantastic. What we've also found out was that for these kind of tendon and, and bone exposure, and if it's small, and again, if surgery is not possible, what we now do is we actually use scaffolds in the conjunction with MPWT. And what the scaffold does is that it increases the granulation speed. So we use a lot of Integra, and, and what it does is that it's able to just put it over tendon, make sure the patient's on a splint so he doesn't move. So there's, you know, because if, if it moves, it's not gonna granulate. And then apply the MPWT, and sometimes you could get away by not doing a flap on these tendon and, and par partial bone exposed uh, wounds. And this is a really great way to have a quick fix uh, so using scaffolds and MPWT simultaneously. There's also a lot of uh, uh, hype uh, in using hyperbaric oxygen, especially in wound centers around the world. But for us, the main indication for hyperbaric oxygen is demarcation. So basically the goal <clears throat> is to get the, uh, the transcutaneous tissue oxygen level above 25 at least. Uh, we have single chambers, or this is a, a eight-person chamber that we use, uh, and the patient goes in multiple times. And the way we see the endpoint is when the patient starts hyperbaric dive, you could see the pa patient's foot on the left, and it doesn't. You don't exactly know where is good vascular supply and where is poor vascular supply. And at this point, the transcutaneous oxygen level is only six millimeter mercury. But as the patient continues the dive, you could slowly see the patient getting better and seeing some granulation. 
And at least for in this case, after 10 weeks, there's full demarcation of the womb. So now we know at least where to amputate. So our goal in using hypobaric oxygen is to demarcate the womb to have an amputation or reconstruction and then making sure that the surrounding tissue will be good enough to, to heal the wound after amputation or supply vascularity to the flap. So this is our way of demarcating. So there is no wound healing, but rather for, for big ischemic wounds, uh, we want to use it to demarcate where's the good and where's the bad. Because if you had amputated this patient during the condition when the vascularity is poor, we don't know whether to amputate transmetacarsal, fourth and fifth ray, or just amputate the toe. And the chances are you're going to have wound breakdown. And when you have wound breakdown, you amputate approximately, approximately, approximately. And the patient goes into a vicious cycle, ending up probably amputation as a BK. So this is why demarcating uh, the wound, uh, demarcating uh, the diabetic feet uh, wound is important in this sense of trying to acquire healing. Uh, we also have uh, used uh, epidermal growth factors for shallow wounds because we all know EGF helps the keratinocytes and the fibroblasts to proliferate and to migrate towards the wound. And then ultimately it helps to epithelialize in these chronic wounds. And a lot of the times these chronic wounds lacking protein because of the protease. So by adding more protein, we're able to facilitate the wound healing as uh, shown in this randomized case study, the randomized study that we performed uh, several years ago, uh, leading to good healing in these chronic ulcers that are depleted of, uh, of proteins. So there are multiple tricks up our back, but a lot of the times as plastic surgeons, these are the wounds that we face uh, in our practice. Big wounds with, you know, reopened amputations, um, exposed tendon and bones, chronic osteomyelitis, or extensive uh, uh, infected wounds. And of course, these are the wounds that are challenging. And these are the wounds that we have to start considering surgical options. Now, as plastic surgeon who is deeply involved in diabetic foot uh, reconstruction, it is exciting. This is one of the most exciting fields of innovation. It's not only about flap reconstruction using microsurgery and super microsurgery, but now we're doing exciting stuff on the, on the nerve, like nerve decompression, TMRs, RNPIs, and you know, these targeted muscle reinnovation and these RNPIs, um, what they do is basically a platform for robotic limb. So now our department, uh, our, one of my partner, John, John Park, is now also involved in, in um, neurosensing these nerve terminals, doing TMRs, and then applying it on the robotic limb. So the robotic limb senses this nerve stimulus and then able to have a functional gait. So isn't this exciting? I mean, as plastic surgeons, getting involved in robotics, same principle, of course, for the hand, and Paul, um, Paul Cerderna, uh, is is in the forefront of TMRs. There's a couple of groups in Europe as well. And it is exciting. It is exciting to be, you know, part of this bionic next generation stuff. And you get to do this by doing diabetic foot. So uh, so robotic prosthesis and, in, in, and even in amputation, there's a lot of evolution. You know, how do we make the amputation stump stable? You know, by doing bone flaps between the, the tibia and fibula. And there's a lot of exciting stuff going on. So if you think diabetic wound or diabetic foot is just about flapping and, and just trying to you know, recover, it's not. There's so much innovation going on because there's so many diabetic foot patients. Think about it. All the diabetic patients you have, 15% of them will have diabetic foot and half of them will probably end up in some amputation or some surgery. So isn't this exciting? I don't know. Maybe I'm getting too carried away because if you, because if you started to imagine that smelly pus from the beginning, I don't know if this is your stuff. But anyway, for me, it's just super exciting. 
So, but today we're going to be focusing on more on soft tissue coverage uh, because that's my specialties. And hopefully next time uh, we'll have opportunity to John to talk about TMRs and RMPIs and how you know we are uh, uh, developing in, in 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 robotic limbs. So the goal of uh, reconstructive surgery is basically to have a, a economical curative wound because we're able to flap. And sometimes in diabetic foot, when you start vacuuming, you vac for one and a half years and you still don't get good results. But we're able to put a flap on, have the patient discharge in, in two to three weeks. It's amazing. It saves a lot of time, saves a lot of money. And the patient doesn't have to go on back for 18 months. Uh, salvage foot, and of course, the goal is to preserve the gait as much as possible, provide an alternative to amputation. And most of all, give the patient to walk on their feet a second chance and thus increase the quality of life. So again, when you consider this patient for reconstruction, the first thing is to look at that systemic condition because it's very important that the patient has a good blood sugar level. Because the literature says if the patient doesn't have good blood sugar level control, such as over 200 milligram per deciliters or HbA1c over 6.5, you'll have a clinically significant dehiscence of three times higher and reoperation of four times higher. And you don't want that. That's the last thing you want. So it all starts by controlling blood sugar level, making sure the patient has good nutrition, making sure that the patient doesn't have any um, coagulative disease. So these are the things that you want to screen. And then basically the, the wounds that we actually ultimately uh, put a flap on is ischemic wounds. Uh, when the patient has an ischemia and there's no chance for them to improve their wounds. When the healing has stopped for several weeks and there's no other conservative care alternative. When there's bone exposed or bone infected or when there's vital structures exposed or when it's just too complex and too extensive and the patient just needs a, a reconstruction. So as you can imagine, so this is the reconstructive algorithm we have. If you, if you, and the first thing that you need to check with diabetic foot is make sure that they have good vascular status. Because either way, without blood going into their feet, their feet is not going to heal, period. So you must check the vascular status. A quick and easy way to do it is through CT angiogram. CT angiogram is non-invasive. It gives you good information. So here in this patient, no anterior tibial, so it's probably blocked proximally. But this patient does have a posterior tibial. It is calcified from some segments here. You can see the calcification. So we know that this is a viable, but it has some calcification. So what this information is giving you is that ah, uh, we have to avoid these calcified segments if you want to do anastomosis end to side on this posterior tibial. So it's giving you that information. At the same time, it's giving you an overall information as well. Um, for diabetic foot patients, you could sometimes you could palpate the dorsalis pedis and the posterior tibial. And when you do an Allen's test or a reverse Allen's test, you will be still able to palpate. But in diabetic foot, sometimes they have proximal blockage, proximal obstruction, and then and then, and then still have good you know, palpable pulse. So for all our diabetic foot patients that undergo reconstruction, we take a, a we need an angiogram. Because look at this patient here. The femoral artery is totally blocked. The major collateral is the descending branch of the ALT. Same here in this side. Imagine if you need an ALT and you take you take this descending branch, what would happen to this leg? And it has been reported once. Not my case, fortunately, but it has been reported. So knowing the vascularity is very important because the calcification actually occurs near the kidney first, and then gradually the calcification starts to go distally. So here in this patient, you could also see that severe calcification in the, in the pelvic, in the abdominal. And look at this, another obstruction in the femoral and the descending branch is the major collateral. So you need to understand the whole vascularity of the leg. And when you do see these kind of blockage, what you need to do is do a bypass or an angioplasty to maximize the circulation going to the leg. 
higher the circulation, better the circulation, the better the chance of having a successful uh, reconstruction. In the past, it was bypass surgery first, but now intervention has become so good that now we only do bypass when intervention fails. And a lot of the times when you do this angioplasty, uh, the vascularity uh, will increase. The, and we look at the flow velocity, and usually it will give you an increase of 15 to 30 percent in most of the cases. So maximize the flow if you're considering reconstruction, especially in, um, in uh, uh, ischemic uh, diabetic feet. Now, once you've improved vascularity, then you can start thinking about a free flap option. Of course, when you have good vascularity, local flap option is also very good. But when you start to think about free flap option, again, the first thing is to maximize the circulation. And then uh, look at it uh, and, and think about which uh, a vessel to use as a recipient, and then basically elevate the flap and close it. Another important concept, especially in ischemic diabetic foot, is that you have to debride according to the angiosome. In the foot, there are six very distinctive angiosomes. And as you can see here, this is the angiosome of the anterior tibial artery. Look how it, mu it resembles uh, this angiosome territory. And if, you're, if you fail to debride this completely, when you do a flap reconstruction, you'll have a floating flap because the marginal skin will not inosculate. The vessels will not inosculate. Ultimately, the flap needs to be inosculated from the base and the side to survive. And if the surrounding tissue has poor circulation, then you're going to end up getting a floating skin. So understanding the angiosome and when the wound is large, debriding the whole angiosome, making sure that the surrounding angiosome has good vascularity and then is able to resupply vascularity to the flap is one of the key, especially in ischemic diabetic foot. So, hmm, that's weird. And also when you're preparing the wound, another important thing is when the wound is dirty, a good way to, to see whether or not this wound is ready for reconstruction is using MPWT. And when you use MPWT, you could actually see this compact granulation. So by using MPWT, you could prepare the wound. It's called wound preparation. And then you could see how more stable it is compared to the original wound and the wound that is prepared by MPWT. And then basically you'll be able to have, uh, you'll be able to do this and have and, and lessen the chance of post-operative infection. So using MPWT to prepare the wound is also important. Now, there's a lot of debate on which flaps to use, especially when you reconstruct the plantar surface. Literature shows really no big difference. The key, in my opinion, uh, to have an ideal reconstruction is the thickness of the flap. The thinner, the less shearing. I think that is the most important key. So if you could get thin reconstruction from muscle, fine. If you could get thin reconstruction from skin, maybe better because it has a skin component. But nevertheless, if you're going to get a thick hamburger on the foot, especially on the plantar surface, this is going to shear and then ultimately reulcerate. So the key is to have an ideal thin contour that mimics the surrounding um, uh, contour of the feet. So that's the key. To having good durability and knowing that for me I like to use a lot of skin flaps and you have to think about again the recipient vessel and the anastomosis here at least when you're using doing considering doing a microsurgery you need at least one viable a major artery uh, when it's calcified you want to find the segment that is spared from calcification if there's a branch from the major vessel you'd like to use that and when it's a stump, you want to use uh, a stump, uh, you know, the, the end of the uh, amputated uh, uh, stump, find the vessel. So here again, uh, from the medial plantar, first ray, you could see how it resembles the angiosome. It was ischemic. This patient looks inflamed because this patient just underwent um, angioplasty. So when the patient undergoes angioplasty, it has a ischemic reperfusion injury. And when this reperfusion injury maintains a couple of days, it's going to start in, 
infl infl uh, inflammation, and then ultimately may lead to infection. So this is why you need to go in early after the angioplasty. So we'd like to go in early as possible after angioplasty, and then debride. And you can see the good vascularity. In this case, we elevated a uh, thin ALT. We wrapped it around. We were able to salvage the, uh, the distal uh, bone of the toe. And this is the contour after 10 years. We were able to salvage the first toe completely, maximizing the function of the push-off from the first toe, which, is, uh, which uh, <clears throat> is responsible for about 60% of the reconstruction, and then ultimately have this great result. You can see this patient has severe calcification. So we went ahead and we opened up the dorsal pedis because we know that there was a spared segment. We saw from the CT angio and it, compl it complies completely. <clears throat> and you can see that this segment here is spared from calcification. So this is the one that you want to use. So we made a small puncture and made sure it has good flow and then basically hook the flap end to side on this. Now an alternative is to use a branch here the branch, the further away from the axial artery, the less calcified it is. So you could also select to use this branch. But remember, this branch is somehow supplying another vascular territory. So if you had the chance, for me, I would not take this branch because it's supplying another good skin, but I would hook it up end to side on the major uh, calcified spared segment, if possible, if possible. Unless this branch is supplying an ischemic territory, then I'll use this branch because it's the same angiosome territory that I want to cover. So that's the basic idea. So here we hooked it up into side, an ALT, and then we're able to salvage this foot. So the idea of microsurgery for these uh, diabetic uh, feet is at least one major vessel. If it's calcified, look for a segment that is spared and maximize the flow through pre-op angioplasties. And we're able to have a 91.7% flap survival rate, limb salvage 84.9%, and a five-year survival of 80 something percent. I can't see it here because my screen is blocked by the uh, photo icons. And at the same time, uh, after amputation, um, we had a five-year survival of after PKA of only 41.4%. So this is doubling. Uh, the five-year survival compared to the major amputation group. You could argue uh, this is this was very similar to our friends in Georgetown by Dr. Adinger's group. You could argue saying, hey, the amputated group probably had a worse systemic condition. We also looked at the ASA anesthesia score between the two groups. It was not significantly different. It's whether you choose or possible to do reconstruction or not. And you can see that after reconstruction, we not only salvaged the leg, but we were also able to improve uh, the, the uh, mortality. So think about this. How many surgeries that you do today is directly involved with patient survival? I mean, of course, you could argue oncologic surgery, but, you know, oncologic surgery, the oncologic surgeons are, are probably, you know, uh, play a role, but for diabetic foot reconstruction, you're the ones playing everything, the big role. And I, I think in my practice, this is probably the only thing that I'm able to help the patient live longer, actually live longer. So this is ultimately a very rewarding reconstruction. Now for you, <clears throat> for those of you who wants to start, start up in, in diabetic foot reconstruction, I think you want to you know, start with easy cases that are non-ischemic. Uh, fortunately, 30% of the diabetic wounds are only um, neuropathic. So that means that the vascularity is super. It's because of their lack of sensation. They develop ulcers. And in these cases, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a very straightforward reconstruction. So try to work with those first because we found out that the patients uh, with, uh, with less vessels, had a tendency of higher failure. Multiple angioplasty, it means that the patient has very bad circulation, 18 times higher. Peripheral artery disease, 10 times higher. And patients who underwent kidney transplant, a lot of these patients, and who are under immune suppression, 22 times higher failure rate. 
So these are the patients that you probably want to avoid in the beginning. But what about these patients here? These patients have severe ischemia. And as you can see, you know, you're probably looking at this and say, wow, we probably need to amputate. But even though, and these patients have severe ischemia because they have no major axial arteries running off to their foot. But despite the fact that, you know, this patient doesn't have an dorsal ispedis or medial plantar or lateral plantar, you can see that the surrounding tissue is relatively pink. Here, relatively pink. Well, this is pretty much all dead, but here also relatively pink. So you have to ask yourself, even though this patient doesn't have a major artery, how does this skin or the remnant skin around the defect lymph? And, and, you know, and a lot of the times when you're doing microsurgery, we always start to think about big vessels, big vessels. Where can I hook my flap? But the reality is in these ischemic condition, there is no big vessels to play around with. So this is where the concept of super microsurgery jumps in. Because super microsurgery basically is an idea of playing around with small vessels using a special set of instruments. If you have, you don't necessarily need it, but it helps basically 0 0.8 or less. A typical example would be doing a super microsurgery, puff rater to puff rater. So using puff rater as a recipient in lower extremity. And that's how we came up with the idea of super microsurgery in the diabetic foot as well. So now remember, we talked about the angiosome of the foot and the ischemic territory follows the angiosome. So for example, if the medial uh, plantar artery angiosome is dead, is ischemic, the surrounding tissue could be pink despite no medial plantar, no lateral plantar, and no dorsal species. Somehow this segment is being supplied. And usually this segment is being supplied by collateral arteries collateral vessels and our goal is to find a small vessel in a territory that is pink and use that small vessel to hook up the flap after debriding its ischemic territory so that is the idea of super microsurgery in diabetic foot reconstruction so remember this patient has no dorsal ispedis but you can see that it's pink here so there's got to be something viable at least uh, in that segment and what we found is that, and we reported, is that as the axial vessels start to occlude, once it occludes more than 75%, we see a sudden increase in collateral. So a lot of new collateral sprouting occurs in this ischemic territory when there's an occlusion of the major artery. And what else we found was that size, the diameter, of the collaterals or superficial arterial system actually increases to compensate for the ischemia. God made our body so amazing. It's amazing, you know, how one thing shuts down and the other thing starts to become alive. And we're taking advantage of that compensating system by trying to find that superficial artery and then hook it up to a flap. So that's the basic idea. And what we also found out was that, you know, when the small vessel artery has a velocity of 15 to 20 sonins per sec, it is a viable flow velocity to hook up the flap. If it's less than 15, we don't do it anymore. If it's higher than 20, definitely do it. If it's 15 to 20, then we try to maximize it with angioplasty. But after angioplasty, if the goal is met over 15, we definitely try to do the reconstruction. So this is why angioplasty is important because it increases that flow volume and the flow velocity to the ischemic region of the feet. So let's take a look at this uh, video uh, that we did for, for uh, a diabetic foot. This presentation is about reconstructing the diabetic foot using do you hear the angiosome volume? and the super microsurgery concept. No? This 55-year-old okay. patient came into the clinic with ischemic change on the left foot, and you could see an ischemic ulcer. I'll try to narrate for you then. 
All right, so here you could see this patient, and look at this, no major vessels below the mid leg, nothing, nothing to the feet. So what we do is we do an angioplasty and we're able to open some collaterals, open some collateral vessel going in to the web space and to the feet. And once you're open, and then we look at the recipient vessel, we make sure that the recipient vessel is pulsating. And once we identify that recipient vessel, we elevate the flap. So in this case here, in the left, we're using digital artery to do end to side. In the right, we're now elevating a flap from the posterior interosseous artery. Quickly elevate a flap. And then basically uh, a short pedicle. And you can see a nice pulsating pulse going into this uh, skin. We don't have to go, we don't have, we don't need a long pedicle. So basically cut before going into the source vessel, which is the posterior interosseous artery. And then we basically elevate the flap and then we bring it back to the foot. And then we start the anastomosis. So here, so here is the flap uh, with a short pedicle, small diameter of vessel. And here you could see a nice perforator with an artery and a vein. And you can see the artery pulsate. I like to do the vein first. So you can see the multiple fat around this perforator. And remember, this patient doesn't have a dorsalis pedis, medial plantar, or lateral plantar, just multiple collaterals that just opened up from angioplasty. Do the vein first. <clears throat> and what's really amazing is that even though there's no major vessel, when we cut the artery to do artery end to end, and you can see that this is a small vessel. And when you do super microsurgery, the key is dilating the small vessel to a comfortable diameter. So you want to dilate using a dilator. And once you dilate to a comfortable diameter, you're able to use that to do end to end, -to -end on this perforator. Look at this. Look at the amount of flow from the collateral vessels. And then we're able to hook up end to end and have this flap go in, and is, we're able to salvage this. And without amputating four or five toe, number four or five toe, we're able to salvage this patient, as seen here uh, in, this pa uh, in, this, um, in this photo. So that's the basic idea. So finding a, a, a recipient perforator that is being supplied by the collateral arteries, and then basically hooking up the flap. So here again, after after Reperfusion, you can see this inflamed uh, um, ulcer elevating a thin skip flap, which is one of my favorite flaps based on the perforator. And then we're able to have this kind of result uh, with a beautiful contour without any additional secondary revisions. Similar principle after hyperbaric demarcating, increasing the flow as much as possible through angioplasties. And you can see the dorsal speed is severely calcified. So we go ahead and use the perforator or branch. And then we're able to salvage at the transmetatarsal level uh, with a skip flap. Uh, this feet here exposed bone. So instead of amputating, we, we shave the bone and we see the bone bleeding a little. And this is all after an uh, angioplasty and hyperbaric. So we decide to go ahead and salvage the, the, the toe. And, uh, and then um, with a small flap, digital artery end to side, we're able to salvage his first toe, which is critical uh, in pushing off to preserve good gait. Again, demarcation with hyperbaric oxygen, opening up as much as possible. Instead of amputation, transmit the parcel amputation, avoid high level amputation. ALT, find a nice perforator, and this is the final result after the reconstruction and having this patient walk on his both feet. So the idea of supermicrosurgery is using end vessels, which are usually digital arteries or perforators, that are being supplied by collateral circulation and which are maximized in volume and flow uh, by multiple angioplasties. So that's the basic idea. So we're not even going to dorsal pedis or posterior tibial or, or any other major vessels. We're trying to find a small end artery that are being supplied from uh, the, the collateral source. So in this series, the flap survival was about 90.5%, overall limb salvage about 93.7%. So it was a little bit better, not statistically significant, but a little bit better and comparable 
to the series that we're using major vessels. So maybe using small vessels in ischemia, an ischemic limb is probably the right way to go for salvage because we, there's no other alternative. And when we look at the same risk factors, we just saw that the, when the patient has peripheral artery disease, it had around the 11 time higher uh, chance of failure. And when there's one or even no major vessels on the foot, there was, it was not uh, a risk for failure. So if you're gonna go, go ahead and challenge yourself uh, to a non-major vessel foot, ischemic foot, I think this is the ultimate challenge and you, you'll be able to salvage these very difficult ischemic diabetic limb. What is interesting though, is when we look at our series by region, what we found out was that the heel actually has a, a significantly higher failure rate compared to our uh, 80, high upper 80% uh, success rate, the heel only has a 73% success. And the reason why is that it is a watershed area. So the vascularity needs to be from the peroneal at the same time from the posterior tibial. And because it's a watershed area, it easily breaks down. So if you wanna do reconstruction, you have to bring totally good circulation from the anterior tibial. And that way you're able to have good reconstruction. But if you, if you don't reconstruct the whole angiosome as we didn't in the past and only have small collaterals without a, a good functioning peroneal or posterior tibial, there is a 80 times higher risk of failure. And if you have only one dominant, which is either peroneal or peroneal, peroneal or posterior tibial, there's nine times higher risk of failure. So to avoid this, Again, wide, wide uh, debridement, and then bring the artery, uh, bring, use the anterior tibial artery to bring new vascular flow into that posterior heel region. So that's uh, the, the lesson that we learned from posterior heel reconstruction. Postoperative care, I think uh, for us, uh, uh, compared to our trauma cases or cancer cases, these patients stay at least average of three to seven days longer. So that's from 10 to 15 days, because these patients have late infections. And a lot of the late flaps that we lose are from um, infections. So you need to make sure that when you have this patient in for two weeks, look at the CRP very carefully and make sure this patient doesn't undergo late phase reconstruction, because a lot of these patients have poor uh, immu uh, uh, immune response. So look carefully. Look for that uh, late stage um, infection. Another thing is that when you're doing ischemic diabetic foot reconstruction and when these patients are undergoing <clears throat> after angioplasties, the reocclusion rate of the major vessel that has just been opened from angioplasty is 60% in two months. So that is very high. So this is not a permanent thing. So what happens is sometimes, maybe three or four times a year, what we see is on day seven or eight, we see sudden ischemic change of the flap. Then we don't do re-exploration. We call our intervention. And this is why team approach is important. And say, hey, look, uh, there's a sudden ischemia on day eight. I want to see an, I want to see an um, angiogram. And then the intervention takes a look at it. 90% of the time, it will be a proximal artery reocclusion. In that case, emergency angioplasty, and we'll be able to salvage the flap. So this is very important that you have a good teamwork, especially with your interventionist if you're going to do ischemic diabetic foot reconstruction. So here's an interesting case. You can see that uh, we reconstructed the plantar surface um, and after, uh, as after uh, reperfusion, and then, uh, and, the, and, the sun, and, and this was, this was the uh, pre-op, we maximized the flow, and this is the post-op, and this is at day six. And it doesn't look congestive. It doesn't look ischemic. It looks mottled. You know, it's like, oh, what's going on? It feels cold. There is bleeding, but it's sluggish. So we went ahead and did an emergency exploration. And what we found was that the vessel going into the flap, very, very slow. So there is some flow but super slow. 
And then what we found out was that there was a proximal reocluded segment. So after angioplasty, look at this pedicle go into the flap. All the way to the end. So we were able to salvage this uh, flap on day six just by doing angioplasty. So you have to be aware that the major vessel that was reopened can reocclude as high as 60% in, in two months. So we talked about the major players involved, and I think we all understand you know, why we need a team now, because there's so, and the spectrum of treatment is so wide. And you need to, if you can, you need to have a good team. And then follow, basically build up your own algorithm and in center of that algorithm is vascularity. And once you understand that and understand the spectrum, you'll be really be able to have a lot of fun in the diabetic foot reconstruction. So going back to our first slide in 2005, 22% major amputation. After this approach now, it's only about 2.4%. So we're now able to salvage 97.6% of all diabetic foot that walks into our center. And I think we made a huge impact. So where are we going from here? I mean, we just briefly talked about robotics. So that's one place we're definitely going now. But are we near perfection? And I want to share a couple of cases here with you where, you know, we did a beautiful reconstruction job. And one of the first questions that we asked ourselves, especially in ischemic diabetic foot, when we do resurfacing, what ultimately happens to the surrounding tissue that are still pretty ischemic? And we measured the transcutaneous oxygen on one group around the flap and the other group that we didn't, we weren't able to do a flap or we did a local flap, not a free flap. And what we found interesting was that sometimes the inosculation works backwards. If the surrounding tissue has a reasonable circulation here in this case, free flap reconstruction pre-op, the TCPO2 was 18. In the amputation group, it was 19. And of course, all these patients undergo angioplasties. And after six months, the same spot, 61 compared to 32. And this rise is because of the uh, angioplasty. So there is a significantly better improvement of the surrounding tissue. So there's, this is, I think, evidence of inosculation working backwards from high saturated tissue to low saturated tissue, and that's how uh, angiogenesis work. So we're able to show that uh, uh, this is happening um, in after reconstruction in ischemic foot, and it's incredible. And what we thought was actually scientifically proven. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's also the functional aspect to think about. As plastic surgeons, when we just put a coverage, when we put a big, a, a big hamburger on the foot. In the beginning, I was the same. I feel great. Wow, we did it. We covered. And we don't really think a lot about the functional aspect. So here's a patient uh, with an ischemic diabetic foot, transmetatarsal amputation. You can see that uh, the dorsalis pedis is calcified, so we end up using a small branch from this. And then we, we did a flap, and then we felt good, and the patient came back after several months with this small ulcer. What was the problem here? We're just thinking to ourselves, oh my God, uh, here we go again, flat breakdown. But the truth is, this patient had a tight Achilles. And because this patient had a tight Achilles, this patient was using the forefoot, the end of the stump, to bear weight instead of using the heel and the plantar surface. So simple Achilles lengthening fixed this problem, and she never had a recurrence. So the idea here is to understand kinetics and now we release the Achilles at the same stage and hopefully we call this preventive reconstruction and 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 hopefully this patient will not walk on the forefoot again so this is why understanding the kinetics even just a simple understanding of the tendon will help you to have a better result so without thinking orthoplastic ortho plus plastic you'll have a less optimal functional result, especially when you're reconstructing the foot. So you need to understand 
kinetics. And for all our tendon procedures, we do it ourselves now. In the beginning, we had the ortho involved, but these guys are just too busy. So we could, uh, the good thing is we, co we could code more too. So it's an it's a, it's a additional income. But anyway, the point is understand the kinetics, do the right kinetics, and then you'll have a prolonged, better functioning result. Here's another case right here. As plastic surgeons, we feel super good. Wow. We reconstructed and we we're able to salvage a couple of toes. This. When I showed this to the orthopedic colleague, he was shaking his head like this. Oh, my God. JP, what did you do? I said, why? What's wrong? And he said, this patient is going to have a horrible post-operative process. And I said, why? Because eventually these toe will migrate centrally. And then this patient will ultimately end in amputation. I said, so? And he said, you should have had a, a nice circular transmetatarsal amputation and have closed it primarily instead of salvaging the toe. So I said, really? The extra toe doesn't help? He said, no, no, no. It's not functionally good. And then I started to look for evidence. And there was no evidence whether or not preservation of one or two toes helped in walking function. So what do you do? You collect cases and you just keep on pushing whether or not remnant toe helps. And we're able to publish this and actually show that when you have remnant toes, especially the first and the second, it has a significantly better quality of gait. However, like the orthopedic surgeon said, this patient will ultimately have a higher chance of minor surgery which is amputation of the toes. So now with this evidence, I have the patient involved. I say, hey, look, do you want to transmit the tarsal amputation and have a less ideal gait, or do you want to preserve your toes and have a better gait, but have later on toe amputations, maybe 10 years later? So now we have the facts to actually show that preservation of the toe helps and have the patient engaged in the decision-making process. And in my experience, 99% of the patient says, okay, salvage the toe if you can, please. And we're able to show better gait. By understanding gait and understanding what the orthopedics sees as a classic knowledge by challenging, by reconstructing and challenging them, we're able to show that this has a better gait. And now our, our protocol has been salvaging the toes with partial ray amputation. So this is, I think, the future. The future, I think, holds, still holds a lot of excitement in diabetic foot. Not only regular diabetic foot reconstruction, but ischemic diabetic foot reconstruction, more advances in, in amputation, and leading to robotic surgery. This is exciting stuff. And I'm really, really glad that I had a chance to share with you some of our latest uh, advances, as well as our classical protocol in diabetic foot reconstruction. So with that, thank you very much for uh, uh, listening in, and I'll be more than happy to entertain any of your questions uh, if you're not still drunk yet. Thank you, JP. Can everybody bring up their videos back up, please? Yeah, I could see a couple of people who are already drunk. <laughs> that was an awesome talk well thank you jp that was an awesome talk every time i listen to you it's so ins insp inspirational and such amazing work and and research and evidence-based that you do i get so inspired now i just text scott saying hey i want to do diabetic but at uc are you in? <laughs> Seriously, it is very inspiring. I better come to Asa one of these days to learn everything. You're more than welcome. Just bring an extra pair of liver. <laughs> uh, okay. I have one question, and then I'm just going to let the residents ask more questions. Um, you know, every time I hear you talk, I think you guys use um, high-frequency ultrasound a lot. 
you know, that's something that is not uh, something that we use at UC very much. What is the, um, I, I feel like the role of high frequency ultrasound in super microsurgery is like key. Can you comment on that? And do I need one of those to do these things like lymphedema surgery as well as super microsurgery and, you know, and perforator flops? Right, uh, that's a very good question. And, and uh, hopefully one of these days I'll be able to talk to you about that. I, some of those, uh, some of you who follows me on Facebook knows that uh, I'm a huge advocate for free education. Most of my talks are on my YouTube. So please go ahead. There's a talk on using uh, advanced modalities for um, exactly what um, Esther just asked. Now, when you look at the ultrasound, and I love this talk as well, because I truly believe that the ultrasound is our tricorder from Star Trek that Dr. McCoy used. For those young people who don't know Star Trek, it's Captain Kirk, Dr. McCoy, Spock, the one with the pointy ear. And they have a small device. <laughs> when they put it on their body, basically know what's going on. I truly believe our tricorder is the ultrasound. And the good news is that they're actually making ultrasounds that are now connectable to uh, your, your iPhones, your Samsung phones. But still, it's very poor resolution, so we're not there yet, but we're getting closer. In regards to uh, your question, Esther, uh, you don't necessarily need ultra-high frequency to do this. The frequency you need is a regular 12 to 15 megahertz probe. That is any GE um, uh, ultrasound that you have, and in, at least in our, in our hospital, all the anesthesiologist has ultrasound. I think they probably, you know, do it to see their, to find their central lines sometime. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it's there. So I started toying with it, you know, 10 years ago to basically see the ultrasound where I could, where, if I could see the anatomy better. And it's been, it's been a miracle worker. It tells you the, the pathway of the perforator. It, it tells you exactly where the perforator is uh, is in regards to the skin. So I'm able to dissect really fast. And when I go into that, that zone of where the perforator is, then I become meticulous. It tells you where the superficial vein is. So, so there's a lot of, you know, advantages in using. And I think in, J, I, I think in JRM it's being published soon uh, with a nice video uh, of using ultrasound. And also to, to, for the ischemic limb reconstruction, I use the ultrasound to map out where that recipient perforator can be. And not only see the diameter, but actually get some physiological data, looking at the velocity, the flow velocity and the flow volume, and, and use that to map it. So before going and buying a very expensive machine, I think you could go ahead and play with your uh, ultrasound in the operating room uh, just ask the anesthesiologist to see if you could borrow it. Uh, just use a 12 megahertz probe. That's more than enough to map out. Now, regarding your question of ultra high frequency, this means 45 megahertz or 75 megahertz. Now, the thing with uh, the probe of um, megahertz, the frequency is higher the frequency, the less the depth. The lower the frequency, deeper the depth. So when you use a 12 megahertz, you're able to actually see underneath what's going on in the T fascia. So we know, for example, when you're tracing an ALT, whether the ALT perforator is a fascia cutaneous, how much muscular component it has, and you know what is the pathway of the perforator. So we basically choose the perforator that has the least muscular portion so we don't have to dissect two hours. So, so having the ultrasound gives you that advantage. At the same time, let you see which is the best perforator in regards to diameter and flow velocity. So it is pretty amazing. The high frequency ultrasound we use for lymphedema surgery because this is able to pick up 0 0.3 millimeter lymphatics. So even in stage three, which is going to be published in PRS soon, now we do LVAs after finding functional lymphatics through this ultra high frequency ultrasound. So, so I think uh, if you want to go ahead and do a lot of lymphatics, high frequency ultrasound will give you an advantage of knowing, pinpointing where the functional lymphatics are. 
that saved me at least one and a half hours. So that makes a lot of uh, sense in regards to the economy or the finance. Using the regular ultrasound also reduced time and elevation in, in preventing um, um, uh, possible mishaps because it gives you that x-ray vision as a Superman and you know exactly where to go, at which one to choose. So that also gives you a, a financial advantage as well because you're reducing the chance of complication you're reducing the uh, the operating time as well. The good news is that nobody actually has written a financial report using an ultrasound, so you guys could still do it. I'm not a financial whiz, so I don't do these economic evaluations. So I leave that up to your young folks. What's really amazing about using this is that nobody has come up. I mean, I thought we think of I think of the concept physiosome. Isn't it? logical to think the more flow you have to the flat the larger you can take and although we have this gut feeling nobody has come up with an equation yet and i named this physiosome because we know that manipulating with systemic blood pressure sometimes can salvage a ailing flap so there is something definitely out there so this is again if you want to do this kind of flap physiology research the ultrasound is an essential tool not only to facilitate your surgery, but also to find answers to these questions, to these long, uh, you know, seeking questions. I hope I answered your question, Esther. So you need to get both. Bottom line. <laughs> Bottom line, both. That's around but, 25, I mean, let's say 250,000 USD. I'm pretty sure that's cheap <laughs> for you guys. Scott, are you going to buy her? <laughs> Um, J JP, I got a I, quick question. Go ahead. Hey, Charles. Hey, Charles. Thanks, Esther. Hey, yeah. I, I could definitely see you are already before. drunk. Yeah, yeah. My <laughs> hair, my hair matches my alcohol level. Um, but wonderful talk as usual. And um, uh, so my question is, what is your timing after an angioplasty? to do, to find the, these new, you know, new vessels to do perforator, perforator. Do you have an optimal time that you would see these kind of vessels after an angioplasty and slash HBO? So, so, so in regards to the HBO first, we would use a transcutaneous oxygen or perfusion meter to measure our, um, our, our, you know, the, uh, the oxygen level. If the oxygen level is just poor, under 25, then we'll have the patient undergo hyperbaric dives. Uh, simultaneously, mm. we will look at their um, uh, vascular status. And if the patient needs um, angioplasty to open up their vessels, we'll do it. But we'll still continue the angioplastic dive, I mean the hyperbaric dive, until we see a, a, a pretty good demarcation. And once we schedule the reconstruction, then we do ang angiogram again or nice. angioplasty to maximize the flow. So the second angioplasty in these ischemic diabetic foot, <clears throat> and I think our, our statistics show that 85% will undergo angioplasty again because there's another segment we occluded or you know, they gotcha. open up another segment. And then after that, we do it soon as possible, the next day, or if that's not possible, yeah. if that's not able to schedule, you know, two days. Because again, two reasons. It's going to have reperfusion injury. We don't want any um, uh, late. We don't want any infections of the of the wound or getting larger. We don't want the inflammation to get build into an infection and get larger. And second is that we know that early occlusion does happen, so we want to maximize the period of when the vessel is open. So okay. this is why we try to do it as soon as sense. possible. That makes sense, JP. When you see the, uh, when you're, you mentioned that 20, 15 to 25, uh, uh, is it millimeters, centimeters per second? Centimeters per second. Through the perimeter, yeah. centimeters per second. Yeah. Is that, when you see a visual pulsatile flow, uh, you, know, you know, we always talk about pulsatile flow and, visual pulsatile flow do, do you, have, you ever see a correlation between that and this number or can 
if you even with seeing pulsatile flow, can that number uh, be much lower? Charles, brother, I love you, but you really want the secrets, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That 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 is the million that is the million dollar question right there. <laughs> and yes, uh, we try to identify puff raters by using an ultrasound at least you know as many as we can at least one that is over fifteen. Now, when we open up the skin, uh, and sometimes we will see good pulsation, but sometimes because the surrounding skin near the ischemic zone is so hard, it's scarred, that while you do the dissection, you, you lose that pulsation. Mm -hmm. In those mm -hmm. cases, we don't use that. The ultimate um, uh, selection criteria for us, visual pulsation is the key. Uh, so gosh. even though it's 15 centimeters or up, usually, it is pulsating if the surrounding tissue is not scarred. But if it's scarred, then we just go a little bit proximal or we look into another option. Now, sometimes when we do the dissection, uh, at the moment of the dissection, it pulsates very well. But at the end of the dissection of the recipient vessel, it stops pulsating. In those cases, we come back uh, while elevating the flap. We come back after 20 minutes and then it starts pulsating again. Then we, it, it's good. Because we know that there was a that there was a, um, a a spasm, but gotcha. otherwise, if it doesn't pulsate, then then we go look for it. But if from the beginning, if it doesn't pulsate, then we stop dissecting and then we go ahead and try to find another source. Gotcha. Thank you, JP. Thank you, Charles. JP, one more question. Another one. Uh, I forgot. I lied. I had another question. Well, I have a lot of <laughs> questions, but. Um, Besides your skip flap for large donor size, for for your um, um, for large coverage, for your smaller, you know, um, uh, perforator flap that random perforator flap that you elevate for foot reconstruction, what are your donor sites? Where do you usually go? I saw in pictures some of them are from the elbow. Um, so maybe where do you take them from mostly? So that's a that's another great question and. Uh... And we recently published an article on PRS showing our selection criteria when using puff rater flaps for the extremity. So we looked at five criteria. Uh, first is we look at the size of the skin, how much skin we need. Um, and then uh, we also look at, you know, pedicle length. Do we need a long pedicle or short pedicle? Um, we, you know, and uh, we also look at the composition of the flap we need. We need muscle, fascia, whatever. Uh, and then we actually look at the thickness of the skin itself, because if you want to do plantar reconstruction, you want to do thick skin. And we also look at the patient position. So we don't want to change the patient position during surgery. So we try to find the flap with the same position. These are the five things that we look at. Now, in regards to your question, skip flap usually, you know, could satisfy all of the above. So, you know, we use extensively skip flap for all our moderate size or large size um, uh, um, defects. And it's because it's just a wonderful donor site. If we need to use small flaps, if the patient has good vascularity, you could use arterialized venous flap, which is also a great, great option. But in these ischemic diabetic foot, you need a proper flap. And if I need a small flap, sometimes the skip flap cannot give you that small flap because of the uncertainty exactly where the perforator is anchoring in the skin. So in these cases, this is why I use the posterior interosseous artery perforator flap. For large plantar reconstruction, if the contralateral um, um, uh, medial plantar is okay, and if the patient has a good vascularity on his contralateral foot, I would consider using it, but in diabetic foot, ischemic change is bilateral most of the times. So I cannot afford to sacrifice a medial plantar artery uh, and the, on the uh, contralateral foot, knowing that it will probably reduce the vascularity of the foot and it might put that foot in trouble. So in these cases, I like to use the gluteal artery perforator flap for plantar resurfacing. 
And, and I am able to do that because the majority of the diabetic foot patients are over 50. So they're not really into their Botox contour. And I har harvest a very thin Botox skin flap because it is the thickest skin in our body next to the plantar uh, and the uh, palmar surface. So in that case, I, I like to take the gluteal artery perforator flap, make it thin, and then reconstruct the plantar surface. So I think these are the few go-to flaps that I have. I rarely use ALT now for foot reconstruction unless I need to hook it up to a very proximal axial artery. In the ALT, then you could have a long, long pedicle. And then that's the that's the time probably I'll use an AOT. So my go-to flaps in foot diabetic foot reconstruction are skip for small PIAP posterior interosseous artery uh, for for plantar uh, gluteal artery, and if I need a long pedicle AOT. I have a question. Thank you so much. I'm Audrey. I'm one of the fifth year residents. I have a uh, question about your you're um, kind of going off that a little bit, the donor flaps. Do you ever find um, vessel disease in the donor flaps? And is that something to worry about given that these are diabetic patients? Um, and have you had issues with that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I guess this is why more and more we use the skip flap. Now, now when we are, when we are students, uh, we learn, you know, the, um, the histopathology of, of diabetes is, you know, neuropathy, microangiopathy, and, and what's the other one? But anyway, uh, the histochemical environment or something. But anyway, that is a misnomer. For us, it's not microangiopathy. It's actually macroangiopathy. All the axial arteries undergo calcification first, and then the branches start to calcify. Now, if you look at the descending branch of the ALT, that, a, that descending branch is large enough to actually be a collateral when there's an obstruction in the femoral artery. So when we look at the ALT, sometimes the descending branch is calcified, is calcified. The perforator from the descending branch is okay, but the descending branch is calcified and it makes the reconstruction just difficult. So this is why uh, we started to go more towards um using the skip because the skip for some reason rarely rarely calcified the scia for some reason so this is why we go toward the skip now in order to see whether or not if you want to do an alt is the descending branch calcified or not ct angio will give you that information or when you do a, a if the patient undergoes angioplasty and you look at the angiogram you'll see multiple indentations in the descending branch so then you also know that this patient is calcified. So when I see that, I try to avoid that unless I necessarily have to use it for a long pedicle, then I'll go ahead and do it. But again, use your uh, diagnostic tools to determine whether or not it's calcified or not. And if you need to use it, you can do it, a calcified vessel to do the anastomosis. It is doable. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. I'm Hunter, one of the graduating chiefs. Is there any role to neurotization of these flaps and restore productive sensation back for these patients? That's a great question. So, you know, like I said before, uh, pure neuropathic um, diabetic foot is around 30%, and these patients are not usually involved uh, with any uh, 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 vasculopathy. But if you look at the overall, uh, mixed neuro ischemic type is probably another 30%. So 60% is without good sensation of the foot. So neurotizing these flaps doesn't really matter in these 60%. Now 30%, one third from pure ischemic types, these are the patients that may benefit from neurotizing um, the, uh, the flap because they're basically their sensation may be intact. But what we found is that, uh, what we found is that when you use a thin enough flap, thin enough flap, that basically protective sensation uh, 
recovers up to about 80% of the reconstruction. So when I do a flap reconstruction, you know, and you have to neurotize a flap, if you're using a, a perforated flap, let's say an ALT, the nerves are all in right just above the D fascia. And if you want to neurotize this flap, you're basically taking this flap. And then you have to ask yourself, is neurotization better or is, and taking a thick flap or without taking a nerve, a thin flap better? If you take a thick flap, because of the shearing, the chances of ulcerating are very, very high despite 100% reinnovation. So for me, the thick, the thickness, the thinner the flap is actually better in regards to um, ulcer uh, recurrence because there is no shearing. So instead of taking neurotized flap, if the patient's you know, inherently thin, then I'll definitely neurotize it. But if, the, if I have to uh, uh, select the flap that it's thin flap without the nerve, then I'll always select a thin flap without the nerve. And we published this work uh, a while back at, at PRS. And I think it, it, while we're talking about nerves, you know, I think I also want to discuss decompression that, uh, whether or not decompression is useful and decompression is useful, especially in early um, neuropathic diabetic foot. So if there's a positive tunnel sign on the posterior tibial tunnel, and then you decompress, then you'll definitely have a nice result in regards to sensation. I hope I answered your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very helpful. I have a question. Uh, hi, my name is Abu. I'm one of the uh, fifth year. Uh, thank you, Dr. Han, for this uh, awesome lecture. I have a quick question, and I'm curious about your post-operative dangling protocol and how it differs from the microsurgery flaps versus the super microsurgery flaps that you do. So, so if you look at a recent paper that we published in JRM, it, it, it actually uh, we talk about the concept of early compression. Uh, using compression bandage of about 35 to 40 millimeter mercury. We don't have a dangling protocol. We basically, uh, and, and if you think about what a dangling, what a dang, what the dangling does is that it sort of trains the flap to accommodate the swelling because of gravity. And the swelling occurs because of the venous pooling. And the way we thought about compressing the flap is if you don't give any volume to swell, then we don't need a dangling protocol and the flap doesn't have to be adjusted for venous pooling. So we started early compression and, and then let the patient walk and then we saw that there was no uh, uh, swelling of the flap and hence the idea of um, uh, early compression and, and immediate ambulation with the compression. So we don't do dangling protocols for all our lower extremity micro uh, surgery, but do compre early compression. In regards to diabetic foot reconstruction, if the vessel is good, is not ischemic, then we follow the same protocol as micro, even if it's a super micro. If it's an ischemic artery, that external compression could make the difference of compressing that reopened artery. So we don't start compression about 10 days until we know that the flap is well inosculated from the surrounding tissue and then we start the same compression protocol and we have the patient start uh, start walking or partially weight bear on it so that's the difference and what we found out the compression doesn't make any um any difference in the vascular flow uh, in regards to this pressure uh, when we looked at our, our 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 results from measuring the the perforator velocity under compression I hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nikki. I'm one of the uh, fourth year residents. I have sort of a related question. Um, do you do anything special in terms of anticoagulation postoperatively for these patients? Yeah, that's a, a great question. By the way, I was smiling because I saw Scott's little baby. <laughs> Very cute. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so so usually the ischemic diabetic foot, again, undergoes um, angioplasty. 
And after angioplasty, it is in their protocol to start anticoagulant therapy. And we don't stop at anticoagulant therapy prior to reconstruction. We just keep it on uh, because we feel that it is helping to open up the vessel. And, and if the vessel closes, I mean, it doesn't matter if the flap's there, it's going to die. So we do a meticulous coagulation during the debridement. So the debridement may be a little bit more tedious than the regular micro, but we keep that on. And then we keep it on as long as the, uh, as the intervention at want, which is around three weeks. So in regards to your question, all the patient that undergoes angioplasty has that anticoagulant therapy continued. We don't use any extra measures, uh, but we do use prostaglandin E1, which is a very potent vessel dilator, and I'm very sure your liver transplant team uses a ton of it. So we use that, and we recently published a paper showing that it helps to uh, open up uh, the vessel in the, peripheral, uh, uh, in the peripheral leg with using a prostaglandin E1, especially in ischemic conditions. So, so we just add prostaglandin E1s for five days to our protocol, in addition to the already being used anticoagulants. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions, guys? Steven, you wanted to do like diabetic reconstruction in your practice, didn't you? He's thinking twice now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Stephen. I'm the micro fellow. Um, it's sort of a lot of information taken all at once. I mean, I have a lot of questions that got answered already, but um, one thing that I was curious about was um, you said, you know, the uh, kidney transplant patients are at a 22 times risk for um, failure. What, what's your stance on end stage renal? If the patient's on dialysis, are they excluded or is that uh, not, not a major issue? So when we look at our, uh, you know, paper, we evaluated whether or not the patient, was it a risk factor for microsurgery? And in our series, it was not a risk factor. So we do believe it, I th it's a risk factor, I think, because of the severity of the calcification. All the end-stage renal disease is from ischemic kidney. And yeah. that means that the patient is severely calcified. But we overcome that by doing angioplasty and opening up the peripheral vessels. That's why I think in our study that it was not actually seen as a risk factor for higher incidence of failure. But mm -hmm. using immune suppression is a total different story. I mean, I think even though you think you've done a meticulous job in debriding, there's always some bacteria left in these dirty wounds. So for a patient that undergo immune suppression therapy, we debride, we put a vac on, we see good granulation. We culture them, you know, aggressively, like two, three times. And then if it shows a, a relatively uh, stable wound, then that's what we will go and do it, do uh, the reconstruction. Uh, that's what we learned in regards to uh, kidney condition and disease. Got it. So in those uh, patients that are more likely to be calcified, the end stage renal, you're probably more likely to use the super micro, the smaller vessels that are going to yes. be spared. Yes, that's true. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. In the same line of I those feel questions. Like our vet... Sorry. I, was in, I, feel like our vascu... I feel like our vascular surgeons um, want coverage right away after revask. Like we often get consulted and they're like, so we've just revasked the patient. We need to know whether or not their foot's salvageable because we're going to do a BKA. And they want all these decisions made like within a very short period of time. I don't know how they would feel if we wanted to start trying to stage these or trying to let things demarcate more because that just hasn't been the, the culture here coming from our vascular department. So I, I am assuming that the intervention procedure is being done by the vascular surgeon. That's why you're asking this question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a bypass is a different story. A bypass, when, when they do a bypass, a lot of the times the bypass opens up a new wound and they're not able to close it. So they want you know, soft tissue coverage on that bypass so it wouldn't dry up. That makes a lot of sense. 
but for intervention, you know, uh, you cannot make that decision immediately. Of course, you know, you look at the wound carefully, you assess it, and then you know it's ready, and then you do the, the final angioplasty, and then we know we're all prepared and we're going to go ahead and do the surgery. But if they send you the patient before you even knowing about it or even evaluating it, and say they send it just immediately after the um, angioplasty, we don't have information regarding the tissue content. We don't have the information regarding the past, you know, infection, et cetera, et cetera. So I think what you need to discuss with your vascular surgeons, if they're even remotely considering reconstruction, that you need to see them when they're admitted at least. So, you know, or at, during the clinic prior to admission, so you could, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, plan, you know, your, your, your strategy. Now, if this was thrown at my face, you know, I don't think I could make that same decision either. I'll have to look into multiple factors. And I think this is why when we partner up with other uh, specialties, we need to educate each other. So what we do is now, uh, when we have a, a, a case where we anticipate multiple departments come in, we have a weekly meeting at Friday, 7 a.m. before the clinic. And then everybody will bring their everybody will bring their uh, stuff where they think they need consultation and and we basically talk around seven to uh, five to seven cases every week and we decide on the plan so, oh my god that's not salvageable i already know about this patient or can you do this test or this test and we'll talk again next week so this is why communication is very important and without that you know unless you're a magician or a superman with you know x-ray vision or one of those X-Men who are able to heal, you know, you're not gonna get a, a good response from us. So I think you need to talk with them, and sort of change the protocol, how it's being consulted. I think that's the key. I had the same trouble when I said, okay, I wanna die of diabetic feet. And they're just throwing at me, okay, here, here. And you know, sometimes, you know, they're angry that, you know, I'm not able to do this, or, you know, I'm not able to do this within their time frame. And I understand because, you know, they think the same because they want to maximize that window while the vessel is open. And the same thing, I say, okay, if you want that, I want that too. And, and this is why you need to talk and gradually build an understanding. This is the most difficult part of starting a multidisciplinary team. And this is why you guys need a common goal that everybody wants. And once you set that up and you communicate based on that common goal, which for us was limb salvage, then I think you're able to communicate uh, much better. And then if that doesn't work, of course, you have to go buy the guy a drink. And usually that works. <laughs> <laughs> um, JP, do you have any um, exclusion oh. criteria? Oh, go ahead, Alvin. You have, go ahead. Uh, yeah. to the residents. Yeah, Dr. Hong, I'm one of the, thanks for the talk. I'm one of the um, graduating chiefs as well. I, I had actually a couple questions. Um, so I was just curious as to sort of what your uh, patients are like in terms of adherence, both to post-operative protocol as well as to medical therapy. Um, you know, especially our county, our county hospital, we deal with a lot of patients who are non-compliant. Um, and secondly, this is sort of a question actually probably for you as well as uh, any of the uh, attendings who are still on the, uh, on the call. Um, I'm just curious as to what everybody thought um, the payer system, um, because I think Korea has a single single payer system, if, if I'm not mistaken, um, while here it's sort of a, a weird mix of lots of things. So I'm just curious as to what your opinions are uh, in terms of the payer system and whether, um, you know, the sorts of uh, you know, reconstructions that you do are feasible. Right. So, you know, <clears throat> I mean, everywhere in the world, diabetic patients are very I, I would say is probably one of the most toughest patient to handle because they don't understand the impact of amputating their leg and how it could kill them. So this is why education or talking to your patient is important. And to motivate them, you know, we have to show them numbers. Hey, look, you know, two weeks later, you did this much. Wow, you have improvement of wound. Wow, you know, if you stop smoking, wow, look at this transcutaneous oxygen level, you improve. And you have to sort of get them engaged in that treatment process. If you don't, then you know they're gonna lose interest, even though it's their own leg. Because these patients are so chronic 
that they're desensitized to their problem. And this is why it's so difficult to get them engaged. And that's why they're so not, not you know, uh, lost their motivation to sal salvage their living. This is why these patients are very difficult. But if you start talking about mortality, if you start talking about, hey, you could do this, save this, hey, look, you're improving. And then, you know, slowly, slowly, you know, and, and they're, you know, they engage. And a lot of the problems, they, they're not engaged is because they're bounced from doctors to doctors. Oh my God, diabetic, okay, go to this guy, go to that guy. And they have a severe mistrust in the medical system. But you're the doctor and you see this and you take this foot and you smell. And I was, you know, I was not joking about this. This patient will cry and say, oh my God, nobody has done this before. You'll have the compliance at least for a few days. And you take that window a few days and you, you really tell them, hey, look, you know, I'm dedicated in fixing your leg if you dedicate yourself. So, you know, understanding their mentality, I think, you know, we, we have to have a different, more aggressive approach, aggressive in, in a way it's more passionate and as more, you know, you know, has more empathy. But I think in the end, you know, it's their leg. And if they, you know, decide to, you know, to, to, to forget about their leg, then, you know, I cannot help them anymore. So there's a limit to what I can do, but at least, you know, through my experience, I've really changed the way I try to converse with the patient. Now, uh, regards to your second question, you know, let me tell you, the more diabetic foot reconstruction I do, the hospital is not happy. It is not making money, period. But finally, after a decade or so, we're talking about robotics. We're talking about amputation with more money, you know, doing nerve stuff, doing uh, TMRs. Now they're super happy. They are super happy because I get, the, I get the name on the papers. I get the name because now it's, uh, you know, innovative stuff gives you more reimbursement. So, so for a while, you know, it was very uh, challenging to actually even th even through this payer system to be reimbursed properly. But I think this is becoming such a huge epidemic. In, I think the right term is epidemic in, 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 in our society that the, the government finally realized that there's a lot of cost going in to managing chronic wounds and managing amputations and buying them prosthesis that doesn't work because they end up changing their prosthesis every one or two years. So I think, you know, at the end, you have to educate the payers as well and then have them understand, you know, how big difference it makes in mortality as well as the quality of life. And I think that's the only thing that I could say because right now I'm in the reimbursement committee for diabetic foot and, and, and you know, it, it's finally and and it's been it's been it's making a difference but you know the, the level of uh ignorance that they have toward diabetic foot is just crazy and i bet the situation is not that different for a lot of insurance company in the u.s as well so i hope i answered your question yeah thank you very much if we don't have any more questions i think okay <laughs> you had mentioned in your talk that you like to use uh you know pre patients who don't get surgery you like to use integra for the scaffold and wound healing is that what you use primarily or do you use other products you well like? you know scaffolds a scaffold i use i think what we have available in korea you know are you know um uh uh, cadaver allografts or, uh, you know, synthetic bovine um, scaffolds like Integra or other measures. I think, you know, for us, when we use um, cadaver um, grafts, there is a, a, a very, how do I say, uh, a regulation that we have to go through and we have to document everything. Uh, and it's a hassle. So I use uh, the product that I don't have. It has less regulations and I don't have to document anything. It just makes it easier for use. And I think for, for in our, in our um, environment, using Integra is the easiest. I also like the idea that it has a silicon uh, barrier, so it minimizes um, external contamination. So I end up using that, that product. But again, a scaffold is a scaffold. You, you may choose to do whatever you like. Okay, thank you. 
JP, I think we held you for two hours. It doesn't even feel like two hours. We had so much fun. I you, think we're gonna let you go. Charles and Scott owe me a whiskey and a beer and soju and a Korean barbecue in San Francisco, big time. Well, no never. problem. No <laughs> problem. Anytime, JP. Yeah. Anytime. <laughs> I think my, my last comment, uh, JP, I just want to say thank you so much. This is very educational. I think for the residents, I think the one thing that um, I hope you take away from JP is that, one, he's a, he's a complete master, as you can see from his lecture. But he, and he's a true gentleman, and he is one of the most humble people you will ever meet. I like the answers to all JP's questions because he answered every question tonight with a study that he did. So I think that's really important to take away that you know, instead of speculating on something that we're doing, JP has looked at everything he has done and then done a study mm -hmm. on that. And then he speaks from everything he says is from scientific uh, data. So JP, you are a true master and a true friend. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful weekend. The party's on, huh? You guys Friday night. This is so fun. <laughs> I don't have to wait until meeting to see you. All we're right, still guys. waiting to see Peace. <laughs> right. Have a great yeah, time. Later. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a Thank great you. See Have you. a great weekend. Be safe. Thanks, bye -bye. JP. We love you, man. <laughs>